Welcome to Chatter. I'm Benjamin Wittes, Lawfare's Editor-in-Chief. This week, Corey Shockey on her diverse career in and out of government, renaming military bases, and principled conservatism in national security. What was so shocking to me about the State Department is that the people are amazing and the institution does nothing to improve them. The State Department believes that people walk in the door with everything they're going to need to know. It was the case until just a few months ago that in the student library at West Point, there was a 20-foot-high portrait of Robert E. Lee in his Confederate uniform with a black slave holding his horse. So, Corey, I want to start with um, we we have known each other a long time <laughs> and in many different contexts. Um, but I want to start with your uh, super interesting career trajectory. Oh, Lord. Um, which is, <laughs> I, I, I think you are the only person I know who has served in the White House, the State Department, and the Defense Department. Um, there may be somebody else, but it would be like, you know, George Kennan or something. <laughs> um, and you're now um, the the head of foreign policy and national security at, and defense policy at AEI. Um, so tell us a little bit, get us started by telling us a little bit about how uh, how your career happened and how you moved from from uh, in in such diverse ways within foreign policy. So I'm a terrible example of career planning because I was a dreamy, impractical kid and stumbled actually into a sequence of amazing mentors who created opportunities for me. Uh, you know, Condi Rice hired me as her research assistant the year after I graduated from college because I didn't have a plan and didn't have a job. And I, you know, for the same $5 an hour I was making as a lifeguard when I had been 16 years old, uh, Condi had me reading everything the American military wrote about professional development for a book she never ended up writing. So, you know, I was doubly on a downward trajectory, <laughs> making no more money with a degree from Stanford than I had made before, and doing research on a book she never wrote. <laughs> then I went to— Although a, you ended up kind of writing that book. Well— um, I mean, or a— Exactly. A, or, or it found its way into a book that you No, but that's wrote. the point. That's why I'm a bad example, because— what felt to me like an unpromising downward trajectory of not having a plan, not making any more money with a Stanford degree, doing research for a book that she never wrote, going to a no place um, graduate school because like a lot of smart kids, I wanted to stay in school because I didn't know what to do. So I went straight into a PhD program that Tom Schelling happened to come teach at. This was at the University of Maryland. Yes, and I was in one of the early public policy school classes, so Maryland's Ph.D. program wouldn't accept Maryland's public policy coursework, so I had to repeat my coursework. But Tom understood I was a flight risk, so helped me to get a promising fellowship when my dissertation was making slow progress. And General Powell hired me into the joint staff when I was a 26-year-old unpromising Ph.D. student because I knew a little bit about the American military from the research I'd done for Condi's book. So I ended up having the fun and games of being the NATO desk officer in the joint staff two weeks after Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990. All right, so let's unpack some of that. <laughs> Most of our listeners will know who Condi is. 
Um, and um, most of them, if they think about it and you say General Powell will eventually figure out to put a colon in front of uh, uh, the Powell. But a lot of people aren't going to know who Tom Schelling is. Tom so, Schelling was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on strategy in the nuclear age. His book, Arms and Influence, is canonical for people who think about nuclear issues or who think about strategy. But he was an economist, as I recall. Is that right? Exactly. So I am poorly trained in three disciplines. <laughs> My degrees are in political science. I mostly write history, and I was trained by an economist. All right. So you are now 26 and the desk officer. <laughs> at, um, it was so much fun. Yeah. So what did that involve? What, it, what, what did you find yourself doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, so preparing the chairman for NSC meetings about German unification, about French aspirations for the European Union to be where European defense policy was, uh, for hosting the early Soviet-American military exchanges, um, for clearing guidance cables for NATO meetings, for doing the interagency coordination uh, from a military perspective of things that couple of administrations, first the George H.W. Bush administration, then the Clinton administration, uh, wanted to do for American policy. So uh, the Balkans wars, uh, coalition building for the 1991 Gulf War. Every single military officer in the Joint Staff desperately wanted to get out of their job and because this was going to be the only war of their lifetimes. Yeah. Well. And I was the only happy person <laughs> on the joint staff because it was an amazing education. What I learned that I hadn't realized before I went to work in J5 is that mostly what the American military are are brilliant teachers because they live in a world where you can't be successful unless you can make everyone around you successful. And I was the weak link in everybody's chain because I didn't have the experience that had trained everybody else's judgment. So everybody had to pile on and teach me how to think about things in ways that, uh, that protected and advanced military equities in policy conversations. So how long did you do that for? You were you – were, this was all before we met. So I, I realized <laughs> More that. More than four years. And where did you go from there? I went to uh, the civilian side of the Pentagon uh, into the strategy and requirements shop. And that was uh, under Secretary Perry, as I recall. That's right. I got there just before Secretary Aspen got fired. And one of the interesting institutional lessons was how you could feel the Pentagon – relax under the capable leadership of Bill Perry in a way that Secretary Aspen, it had been chaotic, um, you know, actually being the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee turned out to be poor preparation for running a million two hundred thousand personnel organization. And why do you think that is? You'd think like if you identified, on the one hand, that there's sort of an obvious point that the House uh, committee oversees, but it doesn't actually run anything. But on the other hand, it's supposed to have pretty 360 visibility on the military. You would think that being the chairman of House on Time Services would at least give you a good sense of what's working well and what's not. Why does it turn out not to be a good indicator of anything? So you're right that it wasn't lack of knowledge or understanding of the institution. You know, the best description, one of the best documents ever written about civil military relations was written by Secretary Aspen to President Clinton after the initial uh, dispute between the uniformed military and the political leadership. I can't remember whether it was about women serving in combat units, or whether it was about homosexuals serving openly 
in the American military. But after um, after that, Les Aspen wrote a memo to President Clinton that talked about the military as a winnable constituency for politicians. And, and it's brilliant. So it wasn't lack of understanding. I think it was... Um, I think it was a leadership failure, to be honest, that uh, he didn't understand that you need to be simple and clear and consistent. As Secretary Rumsfeld, also twice Secretary of Defense, did not understand about running a million two hundred thousand personnel organization, you have to be clear, consistent, um, and simple in setting priorities so that the large institution can align itself to the secretary's purposes. So you then worked under Secretary Perry and... When you say under, uh, you need to be clear about the fact that there is Secretary Perry, the deputy secretary, the undersecretary for policy, the assistant secretary for strategy and requirements, and I was his special assistant. I didn't even have line responsibilities. Fair enough, but you know, I, what are friends for if not <laughs> if not to aggrandize your uh, your your uh, uh, already illustrious history? So, when I met you, one of the which was, I would say, probably in two thousand three or four. Uh, one of the things that was striking about you was that you seemed to know just about every flag officer in any of the services mm-hmm. and that, you know, you you were connected uh, in a way that I actually don't know a lot of uh, defense policy people. You just seem to know all the uniformed military people. Where did that experience come from? I mean, you were at the time teaching at West Point, um, or maybe you hadn't started yet, but you had this very kind of deep engagement with the officer corps that had gone back a number of years. Where did that come from? It came from the fact that they were Navy commanders and Air Force lieutenant colonels in the joint staff with me. Also, you know, having been a Powell protege, I was a daughter of the regiment, right? I, I, I think um, I understood the culture pretty well. I understood their reflexes pretty well um, and share them. Uh, and so I think, you know, the, the term daughter of the regiment comes out of the army and it's the daughter of a fallen soldier who the unit looks after and helps along their way. And I feel like that's the kind of relationship I've had with military, with folks in the military, officers, NCOs, and enlisted, uh, because I had my professional coming of age working in the Joint Staff. All right, so I want to fast forward a little bit. It's now the beginning of the Bush administration, and you are (laughs) um, uh, working at the National Security Council at the time of the Afghanistan and Iraq invasions. Uh, how did that come about for, for those uh, aspiring uh, 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 young policy people who want to uh, work on the NSC at a time of multiple invasions of countries? How do you pull that off? Uh, so I had the privilege of being the director for defense strategy and requirements on the NSC. And most people on the NSC are seconded. That is, they are actually working for the departments of state or defense or treasury, and they're loaned to the White House. Um, I was anomalous in that I was a direct hire because, as you say, I wasn't in the government when I got recruited. And I got recruited by a terrific um, American, Frank Miller, who had been the senior civilian uh, professional staffer in the Department of Defense. And I'd known him from when I was both in OSD and when I was on the uh, joint staff. And so he hired me, and I admire that man so much, watching him struggle to try and make 
the mistakes the administration made in the invasion and management of the Iraq War was a moral education for me. So to say more about that, people associate the NSC in in the, the the sort of common mythology about the NSC in the in the early Bush administration was that you had the the gung ho majority who just were you know had their sights set on on Saddam Hussein from the uh, in a sort of Paul Wolfowitz kind of way, um, and then you had uh, Richard Clark who said no, 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 and then left. Um, what was the reality of the NSC in the Bush administration? So I wasn't important enough for anybody to care about my views on whether Iraq should be invaded or not. Frank Miller's defense policy shop was a small and frustratingly ineffectual counterweight to what Secretary Rumsfeld was trying to do in the Pentagon. That is, Secretary Rumsfeld um, really endorsed the kind of breathless hand-waving about military transformation, that you no longer needed mass to win a war. You could do it by speed and distance and precision um, and believed that our success against the Taliban in Afghanistan was going to be the metaphor for everything. Remember that Secretary Rumsfeld's initial war plan for the invasion of Iraq had a three-brigade rolling start. And so what Frank Miller's team on the NSC kept trying to do, all of us came out of either the intelligence community or the Defense Department, and what we tried to do was help the National Security Advisor and the President understand the amount of risk associated with Secretary Rumsfeld's transformation. So toward the end of the Bush administration, you ended up at the State Department, the culture of which was so different from the military <laughs> that you wrote a book about it, basically. <laughs> Um, yes. Uh, which I, I think I'm one of the relatively few readers of that book who read it as this is Corey's culture shock at coming out of the Pentagon. and That's exactly at, right. At F Foggy Bottom. But tell us a little bit about how that culture shock affected you. And um, you were in one of the very elite offices of the, of the State Department – um, and yet you had this kind of very visceral reaction. This is a building where they're not thinking about how to do things. So I loved being David Gordon's deputy in the policy planning staff at the State Department. He was a genuinely outstanding director, and it was a privilege to work with so many smart, patriotic, motivated people. What shocked me when I went to the State Department was how poorly the institution used the incredible talent of its own people. And by contrast, you know, the American military takes who's qualified to come in the door. And what the American military does brilliantly is the institution arrays itself to identify people who have the basic proficiencies of the profession, to uh, educate and train them to improve on those skills, to promote them for their capacity for future growth, and to support them, to set them up to be successful in the proficiency and to be clear-eyed about pushing people out who don't have that capacity. What was so shocking to me about the State Department is that the people are amazing and the institution does nothing to improve them. The State Department believes that people walk in the door with everything they're going to need to know. Even now, you have less than a year of professional development in the course of a State Department career. 
which is shocking. And it struck me this is the reason that over time the Pentagon dominates policymaking in Washington because the people get better over time, whereas the State Department has outstanding people, Bill Burns, for example. But he's somebody you could throw into the deep end of a pool and they're going to figure out how to swim. The State Department doesn't teach swimming, and the American military does. All right, so let's compare uh, mid-career education in the military and the State Department. So first of all, the State Department takes somebody after somebody else has educated them, and they take a test, and you test into the Foreign Service. The military will send you to college at a college that it runs or uh, at a college that somebody else runs and you become an officer. So you start with a completely different baseline of training. But then now you're 28 and you need to be trained uh, for your next assignment. That at the State Department means uh, that they're going to send you to language training school uh, and you're going to, you know, learn Slovak. Um, What does it mean? What what happens to the 26, 28-year-old in the military who the military decides needs additional training? Well, you would already have gone through officer's candidate school. You would already have um, been in jobs where you are responsible for other people's uh, development, professionalism, and actually lives. Um, So the disciplining of the responsibilities that you have early in a military career shouldn't be underestimated. Uh, There's not a comparable set of responsibilities early on in a diplomatic career. Um, You probably will have gone to command and staff college Uh, You would have been incentivized to do graduate work if you hadn't already come in with a graduate degree. Um, And you would have had non-commissioned officers who know more than you do and have uh, 15 years of military leadership experience training your judgment on it. In the State Department, you would have had six months of initial training And beyond that, it's largely mentorship. And not only um, are many of the people providing the mentorship relatively early in their own careers, but also mentorship is an inherently unfair way to do professional development. Because if you're lucky enough to get Bill Burns as the person running your, you know, he's going to run book clubs, he's going to invest in you. If you get somebody who's not, you're out of luck, and it's going to conf- it's going to affect your entire career. And if you if you look at the way the American military is experimenting now, for example, the Army has completely reconfigured how they choose brigade commanders. So they now do it on a on a basis where the interviewers never see the person; their name is not on the file. The, the candidates are evaluated by a psychiatrist to try and screen out toxic leadership. It's created a 30% differential in who gets picked for the most important leadership responsibility in the Army. That tells you how serious they are about choosing the right people as leaders. There's nowhere near that kind of uh, seriousness about selection. Um, It was the case when I wrote the book, I haven't checked back into it recently, that in State Department promotion processes, you have to recuse yourself if you actually know the person. So you get the least informed people making judgments, and it creates a black market of information exchange where people call each other on the telephone to say, hey, she worked for me, and I think she's amazing. By contrast, in Marine Corps selection of, let's say, colonels. It's, it's, it would be an incredible rarity if several people on the selection committee didn't personally know someone. 
and you openly acknowledge the, you know, favoritism, but you also account for it in the selection process. All right. So there are two other aspects of your career that I want to talk about before we get to AEI, <laughs> which is your actual job. Um, one is your work at the service academies. You've taught at both uh, West Point and at at Annapolis. Briefly. Um, <laughs> and I had the privilege a number of years ago of meeting with one of your West Point classes, which was the single most impressive class I've ever met with on any subject. They're sparkly. Uh, they are sparkly. Um, it seems like, I mean, you've taught at Stanford. You've, you know, been at lots of prestigious think tanks, uh, driving up on a regular basis to teach at West Point is rather a significant investment of time and energy. Um, talk about your uh, and, but presumably a lot of the issues that you've been talking about with sort of cultivating leadership in the military is kind of why you did it for a lot of years. Uh, talk about that experience. Teaching at West Point after more than four years on the George W. Bush NSC staff, honest to God, it refreshed my heart to teach those kids, to, to see the the integrity of people who choose to be soldiers when the country's at war, and a war that was not going well, um, was was ennobling to be around those kids, and the you know the ethos of West Point. And in the short time I was also teaching at Annapolis, it's the same kind of um, ethos that. We expect these kids, these college students, to very soon after they leave the institution be responsible for other people's lives. And yet we tell them what time to turn their lights out. And it creates a sort of a, a soldier's humor that is so funny and so much fun to be around that they take the business they are engaged in with seriousness but but that's about all they take in seriousness. And so it was so much fun. And the folks I taught are now majors and lieutenant colonels. My TAs are generals now. Wow. Um, and, and it's just a delight to see the talent perk through the institution. And what, you know, at some level those people are – different from other students because we're investing real responsibility in them right away. Um, how are they different as students? <laughs> so, um, you know, the joke at West Point is cooperate to graduate. And so um, they pass down knowledge from one class to another about how to be successful which is, again, a very military thing, right? You can't but be in successful. Other, in other contexts, we would call it cheating, no? No, it's not cheating. It's advice about here's who this professor is, here's what she values, here's how to be successful in that environment. Cheating is here's what's going to be on the test. I see. So, for example, um, you know, I taught a small seminar for what West Point called the scholarship students, by which they mean the – the seniors they were nominating for Rhodes and Marshall scholarships. So these kids were incredible students, incredible soldiers, and also incredible athletes because they get graded on all those things. And for them, and I, I only taught one day a week. And these kids, they all kind of look alike. They all dress alike. They all have the same haircut. Even the young men and women kind of look alike because they're impossibly strong and healthy and fresh scrubbed. And so there always seemed to be one kid whose name I couldn't get get fixed in my mind. And I would stumble over. And the students loved that and mocked me for it. And and so I explained to them that when I was a PhD student, I encountered an Oxford professor who had some 
some role in my professional development who refused to learn my name because he said every time he learned a new PhD student's name, he lost a medieval French king. <laughs> so I was going to have to prove I was the – Worth. D- exactly. And so I told that story as a way to cover the awkwardness of me not knowing this kid's name. And for the entirety of the time I taught at West Point, any time I stumbled over anyone's name, the other students in the class – would, for the duration of the term, call that kid Pepin the Short, a medieval (laughs) French king. Excellent. So, right, everybody knew I didn't accept late work. Everybody understood that I would fail students on the first assignment if they didn't get it right, but they could come see me. I would explain to them what I was looking for, and they could rewrite the exam, and I would regrade it. So they passed down that kind of knowledge about here's how to be successful in this environment. All right. So your recent escapade (laughs) has been uh, about renaming bases and monuments and including at West Point. And over dinner a few months ago, you regaled me with stories about the base renaming uh, uh, task force Uh, I won't have you do that uh, in detail because we don't have enough time for all of it. It's a fascinating (laughs) subject that could actually (laughs) occupy its own podcast. But uh, give us a flavor for it. What were what were you guys doing and uh, what was the why was it so interesting and so challenging? So my expectation when I was named to the commission was that this was going to be me doing my civic duty, and it was going to be incredibly tiresome, and, um, you know, I was going to be policing the political correctness of the undertaking. In fact, it turned out to be one of the most patriotic experiences of my life. The commissioners spanned the political spectrum from a sitting uh, Republican congressman from Georgia to a guy who wrote a book about his radicalization on the issue of of renaming monuments. The book was titled uh, Robert E. Lee and Me. And yet under the amazing leadership of retired Admiral Michelle Howard, we uh, set what we – agreed on were the terms of what we wanted to rename, the the selection criteria of what we were going to rename things to. We engaged with communities to because we want them to be fostering and supportive of the military community in their midst. Um, and even changed one of the names we had been inclined towards in deference to a community's preference. Um, The most outrageous example, the one that even now makes me want to levitate out of my chair, was actually at West Point. It was the case until just a few months ago that in the student library at West Point, there was a 20-foot high portrait of Robert E. Lee in his Confederate uniform with a black slave holding his horse. And it was given to the university by the Daughters of the Confederacy in 1954, just as black cadets were matriculating through the Corps of Cadets. It was so outrageous that that was still part of the official taxpayer-funded institution that endeavors to train leaders of moral courage in warfare. You said that you all agreed on the criteria of what you were going to rename, given that there are people who want to, you know, 
rename or the the Woodrow Wilson School has been renamed, right? The uh, half of the Yale College names are under. When my mother found out I was appointed to the commission, she said in exasperation, are you going to take George Washington's name off of everything? Right. So, so given that there's a case to be made, right, for all kinds of renamings, how do you take – uh, a commission that spans a great deal of political diversity and come up with a list of uh, agreed upon criteria that, hey, you know, the the true seditionist shouldn't be at West Point from which he graduated uh, in a in a big portrait. But you know, we're not going to examine the the moral rectitude by modern standards of every single person who's ever had a base named after them. How do you do it? So we actually didn't do it. The Congress did it and appropriately, right? That is That is one of those things that commissions or courts shouldn't decide. Americans should actually have to reach a political consensus as reflected in congressional action about – So the National Defense Authorization Act that created the commission actually gave us the boundaries, which were uh, they wanted no Department of Defense uh, properties named for people who voluntarily served in the Confederacy. What the commission did was decide how far to go because The initial work of the commission was to task the military services and ask them to identify any properties in their inventory that met the standard established by Congress. And good Lord, there were 10,000. My God. 10,000 basis swimming pool street names named for people who voluntarily served in the Confederacy. So – The commission decided to test for ourselves uh, just how how strictly to apply the congressional mandate. And we decided that it would be important, given the political sensitivities of this, we argued about boundary cases and decided it would be important to take a narrow interpretation of the law in order to maximize the political legitimacy of the renaming. So what we is- also decided that we wanted all of our recommendations to be unanimous among the commissioners. And so all of us gave up things we might have preferred in order to strengthen the political salience of the decisions that we made. So what is um, the narrow interpretation of the of the 10,000 000- uh, how many uh, Confederates are still uh, still have things named after them? Well, so I'll give you one of the borderline cases, which was whether to rename Fort Belvoir, uh, which was not owned by someone who voluntarily served in the Confederacy. But Fort Belvoir is adjacent to George Washington's home, and it was not originally named Fort Belvoir. It had been named, I think, Camp Humphreys uh, for a, a soldier of distinction and, and was renamed Fort Belvoir for the original owner who was a slaveholder. And it was done uh, by Franklin Roosevelt near as we could tell, the, the historians working on the commission could tell, uh, had been done as part of a deal to get votes for New Deal um, legislation. It, it wasn't strictly about the Confederacy, although it had been done to, uh, in order to uh, get the votes of someone and to cast a shadow of support for the Confederacy. But we decided that was outside the boundary because there was no direct – Connection because Mr. Belvoir, <laughs> though he may have been a slaveholder, was not a confederate. Didn't, exactly, and and you couldn't actually prove that there was a bargain that was anyway. It was a complicated case, but one we spent time on in order to show 
the thinking of what was inside the legislative mandate and what was outside the legislative mandate. We ended up renaming the 10 major army bases that were overtly named for Confederates and the two uh, capital ships in the Navy that commemorated battles won by the Confederacy during the Civil War. So what is the rename? And then giving instruction to the military departments and giving a list of 100 of our favorite uh, candidates for selection uh, in renaming to the departments as guidance for how to rename the additional 9,988 Defense Department properties. So what is your favorite renaming uh, that has resulted from this process, from the uh, favorite being defined by from the vilest uh, insurrectionist who should never have had something <laughs> named after him to the most attractive, uh, underappreciated person who uh, it's great to have something named after uh, to commemorate what he or she did. Oh, that's a crowded category. Um, okay, so give three. Uh, so one would be Fort Bragg being renamed to Fort Liberty, even though it's not a person. Here's why this is one of my favorites. Because first of all, Braxton Bragg was a terrible general. Uh, it, so one of my favorite responses to the commission work was somebody suggesting we ought to have left it named Fort Bragg because Confederate General Braxton Bragg did more for the Union's success in the <laughs> Civil War than just about anyone else. And the commission had been inclined towards uh, naming Fort Bragg um, for a Medal of Honor recipient from the Vietnam War. But the community came forward and wanted, for, for several reasons, uh, wanted something different. And uh, the, there was internecine squabbling among the special operations forces and the airborne forces about who was going to be. A gold star mother suggested Fort Liberty. Um, and that and people in the community were worried that w wouldn't we have to rename the base again in 10 years' time as attitudes continued to change. And so the community recommended Fort Liberty and the commission supported the community. So I like that as an example of how we wanted communities to be fostering of the military in their midst. I love that uh, I think it was Fort Rucker that was renamed um, Fort Walker um, for Mary Walker, the only female recipient of the Medal of Honor. She was a surgeon in William Tecumseh Sherman's army during the American Civil War. And at the Memorial Parade, for which Memorial Bridge was built here in Washington, so the Union Army could march in review after winning the Civil War, Sherman had Mary Walker walk at the front of his army because she had saved more of it than anyone else. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so she's a great example. Um, uh, but there are a ton of them. So in your day job, you run the Foreign and Defense Policy Program at AEI. And for – It's uh, a fabulous pirate ship. <laughs> so I, a pirate ship is a really interesting metaphor for it right now because, um, you know, you're sort of a famously never Trump – uh, foreign policy conservative figure. Um, talk to me about the role of in a world in which, you know, the principal Republican presidential antagonists are fighting about, uh, you know, whether Donald Trump is a, uh, you know, trans hero, um, as Ron DeSantis would say, or, you know, um, the last thing they're talking about is foreign and defense policy, except occasionally saying things about strong and the border and uh, Trump hating Ukraine. 
Um, what is the role in this environment of a conservative uh, – what does it even mean to have a conservative uh, foreign and defense policy think tank? So I am so proud to be part of the American Enterprise Institute because it is a lighthouse of principled conservatism at a time in which Republicans are having a big and important internal argument about what conservatism is. And the people of the American Enterprise Institute believe in three fundamental things – in defending human dignity and expanding economic opportunity and making the world a freer and safer place. And we do our work to advance those three things. And, and we argue about what it means. We argue about what the right policies are. But we believe conservatives fundamentally are grounded in those three things. Um, and we are doing our best to persuade our fellow Republicans of that because it feels really important to the country for us to win this argument. And what is, you know, the, the there is no natural home at this point for principled conservative foreign policy, defense policy. Sure uh, there is. That natural home is AEI. Well, OK, but that's a small home. I mean, I... I <laughs> I'm into partisan home. Um, like it used to be that if you said, OK, the foreign and defense policy program at AEI, you thought of the sort of brain trust of Republican foreign policy thinking the Republican foreign policy establishment, the people who were going in and out of the administration when it was a Republican administration, kind of a, you know, a sort of when it's a when it's a. Democratic administration, a kind of the kind of government in exile sort of thing. Um, by the way, AEI is Brookings's next door neighbor. So like <laughs> we have um, we all eat in each other's cafeterias and stuff and we're all buds. But, you know, there's there's just def definitely a sense of. But now it seems like it's a world like, you know, it def in in contrast to some parts of the never trump movement it hasn't become really part of the democratic coalition it remains very proudly not part of the sort of democratic foreign policy establishment but also having very little truck with the current uh waves in in the conservative movement or the Republican Party. And so I'm, I guess I'm interested in like what, what do, is the fundamental goal of it to influence current policy, i.e. Republicans in Congress and Democrats in the executive branch? Is the current – the fundamental goal to chart a new course for conservatives – when you know when the the high wears off whenever it does what's the what's the ambition of an AEI at this point our ambition is to win the argument among conservatives in favor of policies that defend human dignity expand economic opportunity and make the world a freer and safer place and i actually think we make slow but steady progress on that if you look at the leadership of the Armed Services Committees um, and the Foreign Affairs Committees uh, in both houses of Congress, I think you would see they align very closely with the policies that scholars at AEI advocate. And where the administration makes good choices, we celebrate those good choices. And where the administration doesn't, we are a government in exile holding them accountable and helping congressional oversight uh, to hold them accountable. So I think if you look at one year ago, three years ago, five years ago, I actually think principled conservatism is getting more traction, not less. And we have work, a lot of work still to do, but that is the vocation of of returning Republican, the Republican Party to reliable 
principled conservatism. And we at AEI take that very seriously. All right. So I would be remiss if I had you in a small studio uh, <laughs> and I did not ask you about the NATO summit. Um, we got Sweden. We didn't get Ukraine. Um, uh, grade the participants. How how did NATO do? How did President Biden do? How did the Swedes do? How did the Turks do? How did the Ukrainians do? So first and most importantly, what President Biden has done extraordinarily well is return the United States to standing shoulder to shoulder with our closest friends and closest ideological partners in the world. That is the NATO allies and the Asian countries, Australia, Japan, South Korea, who share the views and the vocation of the institution. Uh, that really matters. President Trump had, had thrown that in turmoil, and I genuinely believe if President Trump manages to be reelected president in this country, it will, be, it will collapse America's alliance relationships, which are the most important strategic advantage we have in the world for national security. So President Biden has done that incredibly well. On the war in Ukraine, he has organized, in particular, the Department of Defense has organized, uh, you know, 56 countries to be a lifeline of budget and armament support to Ukraine to keep them in the fight. And one of the one of the main planks of AEI's argument to our fellow Republicans is that for 5% of American defense spending last year and zero American military deaths, Ukraine is destroying the Russian army. That is unquestionably in America's national interest. Um, I wish President Biden would be making that case more to the American public because he's missing an opportunity and it's actually imperiling support for the war effort that the president's not – giving the speech in Des Moines, Iowa, that he's going to give in the Baltic states today. Um, I am disappointed that, that largely because of President Biden's uh, anxieties about risks, uh, we are not giving Ukraine a clearer path towards NATO membership. I think it, it is actually the least risky path and the least expensive path to have said, as soon as Ukraine declares the war over, uh, we will lead NATO admission into the membership of countries that commit to a common defense. Uh, because it, what the president said in his very awkward and frankly disappointing press conference in Vilnius and in the NATO statement about Ukraine – will encourage Russia to continue fighting. It will encourage Russia to continue attempting to use nuclear threats to prevent greater assistance to Ukraine. And it will encourage nuclear proliferation to other states because they see us, the country least at risk and strongest in this equation, fearful of running any risks on behalf of stabilizing Ukraine's security. And why... I mean, I found this baffling, honestly. Why uh, – and it, it does seem to be explainable only in terms of what's, what's inside President Biden's head. But why do you think he's leaned forward in so many areas, um, including areas in which he was initially resistant? Um, uh, he clearly agrees with you that 5 percent of the U.S. defense budget and no U.S. casualties is a great price to pay for, uh, for destroying the Russian military. He clearly agrees with you that the all-in for Ukraine uh, should not be just a public stance, but it's a – and he's dragged – you know, some of the more lumbering European allies along the way. Why is he, of all people, anxious on this point? Two reasons. The first um, 
stated uh, pungently by former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, President Biden actually has terrible reflexes on national security issues. He is so fearful of the weak uh, accosting the strong that he abandoned Afghanistan. I mean, every bad decision on national security policy made in the Biden administration goes straight back to the president himself, partly because those are his reflexes and partly because he created a cabinet of staff rather than political peers who could challenge his perspective. And the second reason is that the president's not wrong to be worried about escalation. What he is wrong about is policy choices that convey that anxiety in ways that corrode deterrence instead of in ways that strengthen deterrence. Tom Schelling would disapprove. Sweden, are Uh, they the big winners or is Turkey the big winner? Both. Turkey demonstrated that they are willing to stretch NATO allies on Iraq and torture us until they get something that matters to them, Uh, which in this case was a show of strength, F-15s, a a one-on-one meeting with President Biden, and a NATO counterterrorism um, uh, director and set of activities, and Sweden to change its very indulgent policy about uh, PKK members taking harbor in Sweden. So Turkey got a lot out of this. Um, but you know what? That's what political bargaining is. And, and we shouldn't begrudge the Turks who have a pretty weak hand. Uh, playing it assertively. The Swedes, of course, are also big winners. But NATO, too, is a big winner. We just got, in the space of the last year, two of the strongest allies in the alliance, um, people who know how to deal with Russia and know how to defend themselves and are going to be great contributors to the common defense of us all. Including who know how to deal with beluga whales um, <laughs> uh, armed with you know, spy belugas. I, I, I think the, the, the beluga threat now that the Swedes are on board is Now is that well the Baltic under- Sea is a NATO lake. Exactly. <laughs> Cool. But please, I hope we're not going to do what Californians did when they had a dead whale washed ashore, which has exploded. If yeah. you have not seen that video, it it's disgusting. Yeah, whales should never be dead on shore. They should always be dead at the bottom of the ocean where they provide incredible – Ecological benefits. Um, they, they, the, the rotting carcass of a whale uh, uh, underwater is an amazing thing and it goes on for years. OK. Who knew? Yeah, exactly. C.K. Dexter Haven. You have unsuspected depth. Finally, I want to just ask about Vladimir Putin. You know, if I were Putin and I watched both Finland and uh, Sweden – join NATO in the space of a year and the Western alliance managed to accommodate Turkey being obstreperous and managed to give just an unbelievable sum of money and weapons to Ukraine, approve cluster munition delivery, which is, you know, like that's no small thing. I would be impressed um, in a in a holy shit. I didn't think they were capable of this kind of way. When you psychoanalyze Putin, uh, how do you think he is looking at the events in the West that you know culminated this week in 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 the good and the bad? You know that we got Sweden done, but we sent this somewhat humiliating message to the Ukrainians. Is Putin smiling to himself or is he saying, shit, I really blew this? Uh, So I don't know whether he has the self-awareness to have – to appreciate just what an enormous strategic debacle he created for Russia. A couple of things. The first is, you know, Putin appeared to love himself as the bare-chested horseback rider – 
who wouldn't fight you. Yeah, um, he, I just want to point out that he never manned up and, exactly. and agreed to meet me in single combat. Uh, but but he loved that image of himself. And now he is ashen, afraid to be around people. And Prigozhin, he, the mutineer, is the one who embodies that kind of ridiculous um, masculinity, killing people with sledgehammers. And so Putin is physically and symbolically shrunken over the course of this war in ways that I think bode ill for his likelihood of remaining in power and probably even bode ill for his likelihood of physical safety. You know, we Americans have a tendency to think our adversaries are geniuses because they're our adversaries, right? That the Chinese are 100-year strategists just as they activate all the antibodies against their continued success and that Putin's a genius. The Russians play chess and we play checkers. And yet free societies, because we have big domestic debates – We rarely make mistakes of the magnitude that authoritarian societies do because you always have to win the domestic political argument and you are always going to have vital, vibrant civil society disagreements. And so, you know, uh, we make our mistakes. We tend not to make them of the magnitude that Putin has just made. Yeah, Putin's playing chess and we're designing AIs that can beat all humans in chess. Um, Corey Shockey, you're a great American, daughter of the regimen. Uh, uh, it is uh, wonderful to see you. And oh, I, I what forgot to we have friend. to reach into the chatterbox and pull out uh, a question. Okay. <laughs> if, uh, if you could give one piece of advice to your 20-year-old self, what would it be? Uh, don't worry so much. Um, just do the work. The work will carry you. Don't worry so much about amounting to nothing and thinking that you're on a downward trajectory. Trust that doing the work will be good enough. Yeah, doing the work is... It's big. Corey Shockey, uh, great to see you. And What a uh, pleasure to be your friend, Ben Wittes. So great, to, so great to have you on Chatter. Let's do it again soon. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. Thank you.